All right, welcome back. In this next video, I'm going to go into a lot more detail on mutual funds, or specifically open-end mutual funds. So I'll start off talking about the diversity in and diversity of these open-end mutual funds, how these fund families actually work, then we'll talk about how the funds actually operate. And then finally, I'll show you how the uh, mutual fund costs and behavior of mutual funds have changed through time. Okay, so what you're looking at are the largest mutual fund families in 2020 uh, by assets under management. So you're probably familiar with companies like BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity. Uh, these are large companies that manage people's 401ks, their IRAs. Uh, you can open an individual or joint account if you want with them. But essentially, these fund families, they allow you to invest on your own behalf, and they'll also allow you to invest in one of the mutual funds that they manage. So these fund families like Vanguard, they might have a couple dozen mutual funds that they create and market to their clients. They might also have some ETFs. Obviously, Vanguard does. Fidelity does. Uh, you know, these are... Uh, you know, I mean, quite frankly, this is essentially how open-end funds are primarily used. Now, there's a lot of different types of managed funds, or specifically, uh, I should say, just mutual funds out there. Uh, what you're looking at are kind of a, a list of the types of open-end funds. So some of these funds, they'll target, oh, let's say, energy investments, so energy stocks, energy bonds. Some will target ener uh, value stocks or, uh, you know, stocks with high book-to-market ratios. Some will actually target high-yield bonds, so junk or non-investment grade bonds. So all you're looking at here are a series of objectives of different mutual funds or open-end mutual funds. So let's take a look at this. So I've just clicked the link at the very top in the title, and if I scroll all the way down to the bottom here, uh, what you're going to see is that maybe not near the bottom, but uh, near the bottom, or about halfway down, uh, you can actually break down mutual funds based on their objective or their the assets that they typically will analyze or based on the assets that they typically hold. So large value funds, large blend funds, so value and growth, uh, mid-cap, mid-cap, small cap, uh, re, uh, real estate funds, you can break this down by, oh, funds that invest in U.S. equity. Uh, there's all kinds of different, uh, these are primarily mutual funds here that you're looking at. Okay, so what goes into a mutual fund prospectus? Well, these are the most common types. So you're always going to have an objective. And the objective for a mutual fund is very often capital appreciation or uh, income distribution. So some of these funds will be oh, focused on dividend paying stocks or high yield bonds. Uh, others will invest in growth stocks, which typically will pay offer a very high capital return, uh, capital gain. Uh, you'll also get a sense of the fee structure of this mutual fund. So this you're definitely going to see in class. Uh, these fee structures, they differ tremendously across funds. You'll also get a sense of how the fund is going to invest. So what strategy are they going to employ to meet their objective? How much risk are they going to take on? So usually there's a um, risk metric, so risk objective. Say, for example, we expect to take a moderate level of risk in order to achieve our objective. We'll also th see the past performance of the mutual fund, and we'll get some information on the manager, their background, how long they've been a manager, what certifications they have, like are they a CFA, a CFP, uh, uh, CPA, whatever. Okay, another important thing you need to know with mutual funds is the net asset value. I know I touched on it in the last video, but let's formalize it. Your net asset value is the value that each share of a mutual fund should be worth. Your NAV is essentially the intrinsic value of the mutual fund's shares. So it's the market value of the fund's portfolio, minus any liabilities that the fund may have, all divided by the shares of the mutual fund itself outstanding. So this NAV, it's essentially the intrinsic share price of these open-end mutual fund, or really any uh, fund's shares. Now, an obvious question. How do open-end mutual funds actually get sold? 
Well, there's a variety of ways that these mutual funds sell their shares or reach out to potential customers who would buy these shares. The most obvious here is direct marketing. A mutual fund family like Vanguard or Guggenheim may advertise on TV or in the Wall Street Journal via direct marketing. In other words, the fund family might advertise their fund's performance to potential investors to try to convince them to invest money in one of the funds in the family. The next way funds may sell shares is through Salesforce distribution or Salesforce marketing. And there are several ways that this is done. For example, a fund might maintain a Salesforce whose job it is to meet with groups of high net worth investors and convince them to invest in the mutual fund. This is commonly done to attract investments from organizations that offer 401k plans to their employees. Uh, the fund or fund family will meet with representatives of the fund or of the company and convince them to invest money in one or more of those families' funds. In the real world, obviously, there's some conflicts of interest here. So the, the fund or the fund family reaching out to a company telling them, hey, you should invest your, your employees' funds in our uh, mutual funds and ETFs. Well, is that the best thing for the employees of the company? Maybe not. Now, the final popular way that mutual funds are marketed and sold is through financial in intermediaries like commercial banks or personal financial planning firms. If you're meeting with a financial advisor, the advisor might recommend that you invest in a particular mutual fund because its objectives match yours and its historical performance has been good. Just be aware that at some financial planning firms, the individual selling you the fund may be compensated based on whether they're able to convince you to invest, which can lead to conflicts of interest. Uh, always be mindful of whether a financial advisor is fee-based or commission-based, because if they're commission-based, chances are they get a bigger kickback from uh, probably the, the funds that they're trying to sell you on. So to sum all of this up, there are many ways that these mutual funds are advertised and sold, but the most important thing to remember is that many of the individual selling investors on a mutual fund receive compensation based on whether they're able to convince those investors to invest in the fund, not on whether they're actually recommending a, a good uh, mutual fund to this individual. Uh, so always ask how a salesperson is being compensated before you invest in shares of a mutual fund. Okay, let's take a look at a CFA question. A student from the audience has just asked you to explain the difference between open-end and closed-end funds. Which of the following will be least likely included in your explanation? A. Shares in closed-end funds can be bought and sold at any time during the day. B. Open-end funds are more likely to trade at a discount to NAV, while closed-end funds generally trade uh, close to the NAV. Or C. When selling shares, investors in an open-end fund sell the shares back to the fund whereas investors in a closed-end fund sell the shares back to others on the secondary market. Okay, so we're looking for the least likely answer here. Uh, now, the correct answer here is going to be B. Uh, these open-end funds, they're going to trade at exactly the NAV. Closed-end funds, these are the funds where you could have the discount. So if you remember the closed-end fund discount, uh, that's a discount to NAV. Basically, closed-end funds, you're selling them to other secondary, other investors in the secondary market, whereas open-end funds, you're selling them back to the fund family that created the fund shares. So uh, B is the correct answer. Uh, a and C are both true. Okay, now it's time to talk about fee structures. Now, there's a lot of different fees that you'll see in the mutual fund and you know, managed fund industry as a whole. Uh, we have operating expenses, so paying employees to analyze different securities, uh, doing all the security analysis. Uh, we can also see some front-end loads, so fees that you pay up front to invest in a mutual fund. We also have some back-end loads, or uh, sometimes these are called redemptions, basically in order to exit your position in a mutual fund you have to pay a percentage of your assets under management. And then we'll also see 12B1 fees or 12B1 charges. And these are fees for advertising. So the fund manager will advertise their mutual fund. And if you want to own shares of the mutual fund, uh, you're going to have to pay for their advertising expenses. Uh, now, all of these fees are going to have to be disclosed in the prospectus. 
and different funds will actually have all kinds of different fee structures. So let's take a look. Okay, so I'm on the I'm on Fidelity's website, and I've looked up the Fidelity 500 Index Fund. So this is just a fund that tracks the S&P 500 Index. And if I go over to Fees and Distributions, I'll be able to see the expense ratio for this fund. So the expense ratio of this fund is 15 or 1.5 basis points. So obviously that is very, very, very low. Uh, there are no 12B1 fees. That's fantastic. Now, for comparison, I just pulled up the Guggenheim Strategic Opportunities. This is a closed-end fund, but it's, it, it is still a mutual fund. Notice here that your gross expense ratio, or your, your expense ratio, is 2.35%. If I go over to uh, the net expense ratio, you can see that you know, your, your AUM, or the percentage of AUM that you're paying every year is going to be 1.62%, and there's probably some... Uh, redemption fees or uh, some upfront fees that you'll have to pay. So uh, what I'm trying to get at here is that some funds, like the uh, F, the fund I was just looking at, have very, very low expense ratios. Others will have very high expense ratios. Maybe there's some oh, marketing associated with the fund that you're, as an investor, expected to pay for. Uh, Maybe there's additional costs to paying the analyst to perform the analysis. Uh, so always be aware of what your fund's expense ratio actually is. Okay, so how do we actually calculate the amount that you're going to have at the end of an investment period given these different types of fees? Well, we generally just use the equation that you have right here. We take the present value or the, the starting value of your uh, portfolio or the amount you're investing, multiply that by one minus your front end load, so the amount, the percentage that you pay when you initially invest, times one plus your return annually to the power of t, which is the number of years that you're receiving that return, times one minus x, which is the expense ratio to the power of number of years that you're investing, all multiplied by one minus your redemption fee or close uh, your back end load. So if you take this, you should get the future value of your investment in a mutual fund. Okay, so let's take a look at an example here. Uh, so I've got three classes of investment of mutual fund shares. Uh, one of them has a front end load, one of them has a back end load, and two of these have uh, advertising or 12B1 fees. All of them have management fees and all of them have additional fees. So our total expense ratio here is going to be, well, all between 24 basis points and 2%. Uh, let's take a look at how much we'll have at the end of five years if we invest $10,000 and assume an 8% return before fees. Okay, we'll start with the Class A shares, and I'll zoom in here so you can actually see what I'm doing. So our Class A shares, we're initially investing $10,000. So $10,000 times 1 minus our front end load, which in this case was 2%, times, I'll do double parentheses here, 1 plus our expected return, which I believe was set to 8%, so 0.08, to the power of, well, in this case we're investing for, let's say, one year. Multiply that by our expense ratio every year. So one, or sorry, uh, one minus our expense ratio every year. I'll do some double parentheses here. And we're, if we're just looking at the future value in one year, we'll just take that value in one year and multiply that by one minus our back end load. So all told, at the end of the first year, we will have 10000 $557 and change. Uh, now I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to lock in some of these cells just so we can carry these across. So there we go. Uh, these other funds, you know, we're going to have something slightly different because we have different fee structures. You know, the, the one where we have the highest fee structure, obviously it's got the lowest return uh, relative to funds A and C. 
Now, if I copy this down, you can see the stark difference here. Oh, I did something wrong. Oh, that's what I did. Always be mindful and there we go. All right, so uh, at the end of this period, even though we have the same return, 8% annualized return, notice the difference in the future value here. Fund B with the higher expenses is worth dramatically less. I mean, your $10,000 investment after 20 years is only worth $30,000 compared to like the $44,000 that you would get if you had this lower fee structure, this lower expense ratio for Class C shares. So uh, what I'm trying to get at here is that your annual expense ratio is easily the most important fee that you should be looking at. The front end load, the back end load, yes, they're important, but this, this expense ratio that you're paying every year, it can have a dramatic impact on your ultimate return on investment over the lifetime of that investment. Okay, so here it is. Yeah, same thing. Okay, what other facts should you know about mutual funds? So I know I said this a couple of times already in this class, but most mutual funds in the prospectus itself, they'll state that you can't have more than 5% of the mutual fund's shares in any one security. That's done to make sure that the mutual fund is diversified. Uh, most mutual funds usually don't short securities. They're usually taking long positions on stocks or bonds or sometimes both. Uh, mutual funds have historically been actively managed, but you do get a lot of closet indexing. So basically, a lot of mutual fund managers, they say they're actively managing the portfolio, but really what they're doing is they're just tracking some benchmark index. We do have some closed-end funds that trade like, you know, I guess uh, all closed-end funds, they trade like stocks on the market. And open-end funds, they redeem and sell their shares based on the NAV at the end of the day. Okay, final point. Where can you go to find out information on a mutual fund? Well, the fund's website is going to be the most obvious place, but there's a website out there called Edgar. Okay, so let's say I want to look up the uh, fund I was looking up earlier. So Fidelity 500 Index Fund. Okay, so here we go, FXAIX, here we go. And we have a huge amount of information on this fund. So we could look at all kinds of things. So uh, any kind of uh, reports, any kind of in, uh, quarterly statements, uh, you know. So here we go. Here's their prospectus that came right off of Edgar. And you know we know things like, oh, the principal investment strategy, uh, the risks that the fund is willing to take you know, in terms of market volatility, uh, correlation to a benchmark index. And then if I scroll down far enough here, we'll be able to see the fund's returns annually. So this uh, Fidelity FXAIX. Here are their returns over the last several years. Obviously, 2022, they had a pretty bad year, just like the S&P 500 index. And and if I scroll down here to the very bottom, we'll be able to see the actual NAV of the fund. So their net asset value beginning of the period, 2023, is this. Uh, it's based on the... Oh, say the assets under management, any expenses they have, and ultimately we have a huge number of other ratios that we can use here. Now there are a couple of other websites that you can use for mutual funds. We use them uh, in class, so Morningstar, Yahoo Finance are both good. I'd say Morningstar is probably the best website for mutual fund research that is, you know, outside of Edgar and the Bloomberg Terminal. There's something out there called the Investment Company Institute. They provide a huge amount of information on mutual funds. 
Uh, but basically, these mutual funds, they're very transparent. You can get information about them almost anywhere. So all you, all you really have to do is look around. Now, to summarize, these investment firms, they often oversee many different mutual funds. So we do have these giant fund families like Vanguard and Fidelity. Uh, mutual funds are highly regulated, and they have to provide some very standard information. So, you know, anytime we want, we can go to Edgar and look up the holdings of a mutual fund or the fund's prospectus. Uh, that's also going to be available on Morningstar and a couple of other websites. Now, these open-end funds, the type of funds that we focused on today or in this video, uh, these will always trade at NAV. And this is a little different than the closed-end funds, which can differ from or have uh, fund prices that differ from NAV. Uh, and pretty much every fund will have a different fee structure. Some funds will have a front-end load or a back-end load or an annual expense ratio. Uh, it's just important for you to look at the fee structure before you or your client invest. So thank you.